Hello and welcome to Time for God from St Peter's Bexhill. President Theodore Roosevelt used to go on camping trips with his friend, the famous naturalist William Beebe. When they struck camp for the night, the two men would sit and gaze up at the stars and in the vast expanse of the night sky they would look for the constellation of Pegasus. Then they would look for a tiny pinprick of light next to it. And together they would say, that is the spiral galaxy Andromeda. It is as large as our Milky Way. It is one of a hundred million galaxies. It consists of 100 billion suns, each larger than our sun. They would pause to let that thought sink in. And finally Roosevelt would say, now I think we are small enough. Let's sleep. One of the readings set for today is from the book of Job, chapter 38, the first seven verses. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. One of the ways God speaks to us is through his creation. In this amazing reading from the book of Job, Job has been going through a terrible time and now he cries out to God asking why things are as they are. Why is it not fair? And here God replies and he says, look, look at what have I, what I have created. Do you understand it? Do you? I like how creation is portrayed as a huge building project. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Who marked off its dimensions? Who stretched a measuring line across it? It is like a huge grand design, only without Kevin MacLeod being grumpy about it being behind schedule and over budget and not having architectural integrity. Instead, we have the angels and the stars singing for joy at its beauty and magnificence. Creation just is. But our lives have ups and downs, good and bad. In his story, Job has been seeking God through the bleakness and the silence. And now it is as if God suddenly throws open the door throws it open so wide that Job almost falls over with surprise. There is real joy in God's answer. Look at it all. And with the joy, there is also the humbling question of what right do any of us mere humans have to expect to understand life or to question and challenge God? If we can't understand creation, how can we possibly expect to understand the Creator? God's questions are not intended to humiliate Job, but they are there to challenge him, and by extension us. They are meant to make us reconsider what we already know about God and to see its mystery afresh. Job has been addressing God as if he were in a calm legal courtroom, but it is out of the whirlwind that God speaks. And although Job would have seen the whole experience as terrifying, it means that Job is not alone. He is not ignored. Instead, God comes to him and restores him, spiritually as well as physically. This is where the Bible breaks away from all other religious writings of the time. Other religions were saying that we are just the playthings of vengeful gods. But with the one God, things are different. And God does not belittle Job's intelligence or ours. Neither does God pour scorn on Job's lament. Instead, Job is encouraged to use all his mental strength to try to understand God's intentions and to accept God's blessing. But we still find it hard just to accept things. 
We find the idea of God coming to us, which after all is the story of the Bible, difficult to accept. We want to put things in order, to make sense of things and to know our place within it. And we want our place in the order of things to be as high as possible which is where we finally get back to James and John. The two brothers have now spent several years following Jesus, living with him and hearing him teach and seeing how he lives. They have gone on missions, preaching for themselves, and seen how he treats both rich and poor, social elite and outcasts all alike. James and John have seen the wonders of his miracles, and yet even after all this they are still thinking in worldly terms of greatness and status. And they sidle up to Jesus and ask, Let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left in your glory. They haven't got it. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Who marked off its dimensions? Who stretched a measuring line across it? They haven't got it. Not yet, anyway. Both James and John went to do amazing things later, but at this stage. Although perhaps if you were to challenge James and John, they would protest that they were asking to sit in the two greatest places of honour, not for selfish reasons, but for noble ones. They were feeling so close to their wonderful master that they wanted to continue like that for ever and ever. Amen. Possibly. We can't know for certain, of course. Whatever their motivation, look at Jesus' reaction. He is having none of it. You don't know what you are asking, he says. You can feel him shaking his head. Have they not listened to anything? At best, they are being arrogant in their ignorant enthusiasm. This is fabulous and I want more of it. At worst... James and John are being incredibly selfish. I'm ever so holy, me. I deserve the best. If they had any true inkling of the real cost of what they are asking, they would not have asked. The words Jesus uses are very significant. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? Cup and baptism baptism can also be translated flood, were words of judgment and suffering. Indeed, all the disciples went on to have a hard time of it, and most came to sticky ends. But Jesus says, it is for God alone to give honour and status. And the other disciples come out of this story nearly as badly when they hear what has been going on. They grumble, and the hint is that they wanted these places for themselves. So Jesus patiently explains to them once again that God's kingdom is different. True greatness does not lie in wealth or fame or where you sit at the table. It lies in humble service. And Jesus is the model, the example. Jesus is the suffering servant. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. Sometimes our mem memory verse today is used to say that Jesus died only for some people. For many, yes, but not for all. But I think this goes against what Jesus says elsewhere. Rather, I believe Jesus is stressing the great number ransomed by his death. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Today's message is really all about the humble obedience that comes through service and perseverance, through giving our lives to Christ. It is not about glory and status, but taking what comes, if that is what it takes, because it is the right thing to do. And for Jesus, it was the right thing to do. So why should we be any different? Learning this would eventually take James and John on a journey that took the church worldwide. It is why we are here today. And learning this is what eventually makes us wise enough to listen with our minds and our hearts to what is really important. 
and to live that out in our daily lives as citizens of the Kingdom of Heaven. Amen. <laughs>